Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Hahn, the Craig M. Birch Dean of the College of Engineering, and I would like to welcome everyone to the second installment of our fall 2021 faculty lecture series. Our goal remains the same, to share our research success and impact with our alumni and friends, many of you who generally support the college and have truly helped to make this and other events happen. Today's talk is exciting. It's entitled Engineering Our Energy Future, Workforce Development for Zero-Based Carbon Emissions by 2050. The United States has set a goal of zero carbon emissions by 2050 as part of an overarching world goal of limiting the emission of gases that are associated with increased climate variability and average temperature rises globally. Trends that are associated with climate change that are having and will have detrimental effects on the quality of human life. I often talk about energy as one of our global challenges, our big societal problems, along with food and water and healthcare and security. Part of the solution portfolio will be printable energy conversion technologies, which can include solar power and batteries, which offer a sustainable and a highly scalable pathway towards realizing this goal. Today's talk will focus on the exciting aspects of chemical engineering and material science engineering, driving our new future and energy conversion and storage, including an emphasis on exciting new workforce development opportunities for engineering students to interface with the Department of Defense and our national laboratory infrastructure. Today, you will hear about recent efforts by our panelists to improve the next generation of energy technologies and exciting new programs to provide world-class training to a diverse group of scientists and engineers to push these technologies in the coming years. So really today we're talking about our primary missions of teaching and research, so it's exciting. I'd like to now introduce our two panelists. If uh, Adam and Aaron would join me. Excellent. I'll start with Dr. Aaron Ratcliffe. Aaron is an Associate Professor of Chemical and Environmental Engineering here at the University of Arizona with joint appointments in the departments of material science and engineering and chemistry and biochemistry and an appointment at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, in Golden, Colorado. She received her BS in chemistry, mathematics, and physics from St. Olaf College and her PhD in physical chemistry from Iowa State University. Dr. Ratcliffe's research group, the Laboratory for Interface Science of Printable Electronic Materials is focused on the application of electrochemistry and spectroscopy to better understand the functionality of printable electronic materials, interfaces, and devices. The majority of her research efforts target understanding the structure property relationships that govern charge transfer kinetics and transport of electronic and ionic species with connections to energy conversion devices and biosensors. Definitely doing some serious engineering and science, Aaron. And Dr. Adam Prince. Adam is an assistant professor in chemical and environmental engineering with a joint appointment in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering, that interdisciplinary theme. He earned his PhD in nanoengineering at the University of California, San Diego, where he worked, where his work focused on the co-optimization of the mechanical compliance and electronic performance of polymer-based solar cells. He then completed his postdoctoral work at Stanford University, studying the thermomechanical stability of perovskite-based solar cells. If you don't know what a perovskite is, they're ABX3. I looked that up. I had to check on that out on myself. I couldn't quite remember. His research group aims to produce high-performance printable electronics with environmental stability, with environmental stability using scalable methods. So really welcome to our panel, Adam and Aaron. I'm really looking forward to a great discussion. Before we get into your technical talk, let's just kind of kick off with one question to sort of break the ice. What opportunities do you see for the University of Arizona to position itself as a leader, a national leader, for example, in green energy moving into the future? I'll let Aaron go and then Adam have a little uh, groundbreaking with that question. So thank you. Um, I, I think that one of the biggest opportunities that we have is obviously our region in being uh, abundance of sunlight. And so we have more than enough solar power to power everything that we need. We also have a very unique climate opportunity with being a arid and hot, dry climate. And so we have the um, 
ability to create some very, very unique test beds, as uh, Dean Hanneman mentioned, not only just for energy, but the consideration of food and water and security in that respect as well. And I think the last piece, and I know this is a bit biased, but my, my personal opinion is that one of our biggest resources that we have is our students. I think we have a fantastic group of students that are incredibly inspirational. And so that really does lend itself towards inspiring faculty as well to come up with the next big thing. I agree with you all the way, Erin. I share that sentiment every single day when we look at the wonderful students that we have. Yeah, Adam, what do you think about our sort of leadership in green energy and our potential? Well, I think Erin really kind of nailed it right there. She's, she's, hit, she's hit all the points that I would cover if I had to answer this question first. But, but to expand upon that, um, I would say we also are developing a really good core of faculty and uh, research capabilities on campus. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few of these, these uh, capabilities going forward in this talk. Um, but, but one thing we want to take advantage of, and, and you touched on this before, is, is printable uh, solar electronics. And, and this is something that we have a, a strength in, um, and we are actually developing really nice uh, capabilities to, to both train students in these aspects and also start to scale this production. And so we kind of think that going in this direction, given the abundance of sunlight, makes a whole lot of sense for the University of Arizona. Excellent. I think we're going to have a great discussion today. So as we've done with this format, I'm going to turn it over to Adam and Aaron to give a formal presentation for about 15 or so minutes, and then we'll come out of that and move into Q of A. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Adam and Aaron. Okay. So um, as Dean Hahn had, had said earlier in his introduction, which, which I greatly appreciate that you kind of um, set the tone for us here, but the UN has set a, a deadline of 2050 to, re to reduce carbon emissions down to zero. And this deadline is set so that we can cap global uh, climate increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, okay? And so this is sort of an all hands on deck call for people who work on green energies like Aaron and myself. And so today we're gonna talk about a few of our programs that are trying to address this problem. And also, uh, perhaps more importantly, our efforts in training more hands to come on deck and help us out here. Okay. And so anytime I talk about energy, you know, I like to kind of frame the problem in terms of total power consumption. Okay. And if you think about global electricity consumption, it's a really large number, so 23 petawatt hours Okay, annually, which is used. And that's an enormous number. And so I'll shrink it a little bit. If you think about 100 watt incandescent light bulbs, something we're all pretty familiar with, it would, if you've shown 230 billion of those for an hour, that's about as much electricity as we consume globally every year. Okay. And if you want to shrink that even more, you can think about 30 of those light bulbs for every man, woman, and child on Earth. And the U.S. consumes about 15 to 20% of that total electricity, so around four petawatt hours. And if you look at the breakdown of how the U.S. generates electricity and where our energy consumption uh, comes from, it's, it's, it's a lot of the usual suspects. So fossil fuels, a big chunk of it is petroleum, coal, natural gas. And then we have some more green technologies like biomass, uh, geothermal, wind, solar, uh, hydro. And I really want to focus on solar here. Okay. And right now, about 1.25% of our energy is coming from solar energy. And when I started as a grad student just about a decade or so ago, that number was only 0.15%. And so it's a tremendously growing industry. And the reason for this is that the amount of energy that strikes this, the earth in the form of sunlight every year, or excuse me, in an hour is equal to the amount of energy used by all of humanity within a year, okay? So we're getting as much energy as we consume within an hour. So that's a big reason to focus on solar. Now we would have a basket of technologies like hydro and, and nuclear and wind, but solar is really the big pusher here. And, and that makes a lot of sense if you think about where we are. So we're in Tucson, as has been said a couple of times already, we have a lot of sunlight. There are about 286 sunny days per year on average here in Tucson. So it makes a lot of sense to focus on the, the energy source that actually can harvest that, that sunlight, okay? If we also look forward to the next couple of decades, 
solar PV is supposed to grow tremendously. And the use of solar PV is expected to consume about a third of all energy sources throughout the globe. Right, so if we think about what are the viable technologies and specifically solar cells, right? Enroll produces this chart which provides the timeline of the solar cell efficiency, which is effectively the number of light photons that are harvested and converted into the number of electrons for electricity. Right? And so in the last 45 plus years, you can see that there's been not only a significant increase in overall power conversion efficiency, but also that there's been a diversification in the types of technologies that are available to do that. So if I wanna call your attention uh, to uh, the blue line that's running through the middle, that's silicon, right? So silicon really has been rather uh, stagnant uh, for many decades, um, operating at about 26% or so. And so much of that is focused really on just reducing cost. Right, but technologies that Adam and I work on, um, principal solar, are really what are considered these next generation technologies. Right, so these are our organic solar cells, which is using um, dyes or pigments analogous to what you would see in paints um, that uh, can be used to harvest the sunlight. So that's this uh, purple arrow, which has about an 18% conversion efficiency. And then these perovskites, these ABX3 uh, that we just touched on at the very beginning here. Again, another type of printable solar material which uses metal cations and organic cations combined with halides. So your chloride, iodide, bromide types of materials. Okay. If you look closely at this chart, oh, Sorry, what you can see is that these technologies have really benefited from the technologies that came prior. They have a much, much steeper slope in terms of their power conversion efficiency. And so for reference, where we're at, if you think about how nature does this, a leaf is really on the order of about 3% power conversion efficiency. So you don't have to have a really, really high power conversion efficiency if you can make a lot of a particular type of uh, reactor. All right, so this really brings us into the key advantages of printable solar or printable photovoltaics. Right? One of the big things is that you get this ultra low cost of production yield. And so what that means is that the amount of energy that goes into making the actual solar panel and the amount of time that that solar panel must be active in order to pay that energy debt. And so printable solar can pay that back within a day approximately versus silicon, which requires a significant amount of energy payback in the order of about three plus years. Right? The other thing that this does is this lets us move into different types of markets. And so what we have is aesthetic um, contributions as well. So we don't have to have panels that are just restricted to the roof, but that we can make transparent or semi-transparent types of panels that can be used for uh, uh, very showy types of, of opportunities. We're showing you some examples from around the world, as well as that these can be planted um, fabricated on flexible surfaces, uh, plastics, metals, foils, using the same type of technologies that would say print newspapers. And so these have also applications with um, the fuse networks, such as um, uh, in enclosures on greenhouses where you can use the solar panel to do harvest the light um, that the plants don't need while letting the rest of the plants need to, uh, to transmit through. Okay, and, and I wanna pull on that thread of the flexible uh, the flexible substrates, and that, that's a big one for me. Um, and, and if you think about the weight of a average silicon device, so it's a silicon device, usually slab between two thick pieces of glass, that weighs on average around 20 kilograms per square meter. It can go up to around 60 kilograms per square meter. Now, if we're using these flexible substrates, plastics or metal foils, we can actually reduce the total amount of material in the device tremendously. And so the substrates go from being these thick slabs of glass down to around 100 microns uh, of width. And so that can greatly reduce the, the weight of the total device. And so that allows us to significantly increase the power density or the power per weight of our devices. And if you compare these, these new principal technologies to old you know, silicon, crystalline silicon, polysilicon, uh, gallium arsenide type technologies, you can see that the, the ultra thin organic photovoltaics and perovskites actually have the highest power density of any of these technologies by an order of magnitude. Now, this is from a paper back in 2015. That's actually increased even more 
um, as, as both of these have had significant increases in efficiency over the last few years. And what this does is it enables new technologies, new applications. So you can think about applications where weight is a significant consideration, like uh, putting these things on airplanes. You don't want to weigh down your airplane. Uh, that reduces the amount of payload you can put into the plane and also increases the amount of fuel that you would have to carry, increasing the total cost. So you want to reduce the total weight of that uh, of, of your modules. And in this case, these ultra thin uh, photovoltaics can do that. And then thinking forward 20 or 30 years, I'm thinking about space. Okay. And so putting these things out in space is something that we should be considering as we discuss the potential realities of actually putting more permanent colonies on uh, places like the moon or Mars uh, long term. And so weight is a significant issue here when you consider that it costs about one to $2,000 um, to send uh, one to $2,000 per kilogram to send a payload up to space locally. And that increases to around $10,000 per, per kilogram if you want to go to Mars. Now, if you think about how much power it takes to power the International Space Station, um, it, it, it's actually a solar array of around 2,500 square meters. And you would need something larger for, for more permanent colonies. And so reducing the weight will actually save billions upon billions of dollars. Right. And another application that we have is associated with the power of the Internet of Things. There are all of the different types of electronic devices that are continually um, emerging to uh, improve our quality of life. And so one really interesting advantage of the principal solar technologies that we're working on is that um, they can also be used as indoor photovoltaics, meaning that they harvest the ambient light, uh, such as in an office space, and can be used to power or charge different types of devices. And here, these materials are actually um, outperforming some of the uh, more conventional materials because of, of some of their advantages. And so the indoor photovoltaic market is growing almost um, directly in parallel with the wireless sensor market, uh, pushing um, well into the tens of billions in the projected next few years. Okay, so to achieve all this, these goals and in, in, in power, um, you know, to increase our power to 30% to generation, um, through solar, we need significant manufacturing capacity, okay? And, and, and so there's significant potential for large growth in this area. So I just want to think of a really idealized case, not think about 30%, but let's think in a perfect world uh, where Aaron and I get tons of funding and we are now powering 100% of the US with solar energy. Um, so if we want to hit that four petawatt hour uh, of electricity consumption, we can look at how much land mass would be required to be covered by solar cells. Now, you know, Aaron showed the, the efficiency chart earlier, and those are for idealized uh, lab scale devices. You know, the, the efficiencies of 25% for perovskite and 20% for OPB are a little high. When you start scaling these, you'll lose a little bit of efficiency. So let's assume 15% efficiency for large scale modules of organic photovoltaics. That would require about 120 billion square meters of land area or around the, the size of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, it, at 20% efficiency for perovskite, um, it would be about 80 billion square meters required or the state of South Carolina. So it's a lot, of, a lot of surface area. And the first place everyone thinks about putting solar cells is on a rooftop. And if we covered every single rooftop um, in, in residential, commercial, and industrial applications, that'd be about 8 billion square meters. Okay, so, so we're not quite getting to that that area uh, uh, of 80 billion to 120 billion square meters. So you might be thinking to yourself, this is, this is a non-starter, um, but that's not right, right? Because we can have localized farms um, that, that can cover a lot of area. And in fact, we've actually built structures already on this kind of scale. So we built roads. And if you look, count all the surface area of roads throughout the United States, that's 160 billion square meters. Um, and we can actually produce solar cells at prices similar to roads. Uh, long term. Okay, so one of the things we are looking at here at the University of Arizona is scaling the manufacturability of these kinds of solar cells. Okay, and we were recently awarded a grant from the Department of Energy to do such. So we've developed a technology here called rapid printing. It's a restricted area printing by ink drawing is, is what that stands for. And the goal for this technology is to, to expedite commercial viability of perovskites. And so we can print these roll to roll, okay, like newspapers, as Aaron had said before. 
And we can print these things at at least one meter per minute, okay? And the nice thing about this technology compared to other printing technologies is that it actually it allows us to control the nucleation and growth of the perovskite crystals so that we get higher quality films. And this will address some of the negative effects on performance and stability that are imparted by other processing techniques. So if we, if we see this to fruition and we've developed this nice rapid printing technique, we now need growth in, in the workforce to implement this. Okay. The current workforce of, uh, in solar right now is around 230,000. President Biden has, has set a target for 100% clean energy use by 2035. And to meet this goal, we need to grow the solar workforce from 230,000 to 900,000. Okay, so there's significant opportunity here to train students in green energy and specifically in solar. And if we look at the current workforce uh, of solar and we break it down by demographics and then we compare that to the US workforce overall, we see that there's actually um, some alignment opportunities there, okay? So that there's, there's a lower workforce in solar of uh, uh, female workers and black workers. And so we need to, we need to um, take, this, take advantage of training uh, populations that are underrepresented in this currently. Right. So with that, obviously, with the University of Arizona and the College of Engineering, we have a very diverse population of undergraduates that are also what's really fun that we see as faculty is how excited they are about renewable energy uh, opportunities, not just necessarily energy itself, but the focus on these printable types of technologies. And one of the really unique aspects of printable solar types of materials is that it allows us to make a large number of panels very, very quickly. It allows the students to pose their own hypotheses and then go directly into the lab, fabricate the panels and test their hypotheses. So it's not just a, oh, is this a academic exercise in making solar panels? And is this possibly an economic viability? But because our mission is to train the next generation of solar energy related workforce, this gives the students these types of opportunities that you wouldn't necessarily have from say a large fab production line. All right, so with that, I just wanna spend a couple of minutes telling you about two very exciting opportunities that we have um, going on right now at the University of Arizona. The first is the development of a diverse workforce through what's called Indigifuse, Indigenous Food, Energy and Water Security Sovereignty. Right? And this is not just a college of engineering, it is a large group of faculty that have come together in order to increase in cultural awareness and infuse expertise directly to address indigenous community challenges. Right? And so these printable solar technologies are featured in the energy thrusts of this grant. What I'm showing you here in the middle is Becca Waller, who just graduated with her PhD. She worked for Marac Serra in biosystems and in collaboration with Kelly Simmons Potter in electrical and computer engineering. Right, and this is the SEAC, which is the Controlled Environment Agriculture uh, Center out in um, Campbell and Roger. And at the top here of this very large scale greenhouse are commercially printed organic photovoltaic materials. And you can see the large yield of tomato crops that were able to be gathered from underneath these panels, where they would allow certain lights or photons to, to reach the plants while also harvesting some of that light and converting it to electricity as well. Right. And the second one that is just getting going on our first quarter of a three-year uh, effort is funded by the Office of Naval Research, who has been historically a significant funder in um, printable electronics, and including um, the origin of several Nobel Prizes. Right. And here, what we're really trying to do is bridge the gap between high-tech government jobs associated with the national laboratories and our diverse groups of students. And so we're trying to leverage our um, uh, ever emerging and um, uh, undergraduate design program now across all four years, as well as include a number of mentoring opportunities, both for undergraduates, graduate students, and, and like I said, uh, uh, federal uh, national labs, Department of Defense. And so really trying to invoke this guide on the side type of philosophy where the students are um, testing hypotheses in real time on things that are actually translatable to a real product. 
All right, so with that, what we wanna do is uh, wrap it up here and we're excited to get to the Q&A. Um, hopefully we've inspired you to think a little bit about solar technologies, not just for rooftop, but for a variety of other types of, of solutions and opportunities. Um, and then the University of Arizona is really interested in improving the scalability of the next generation solar technologies. I saw a couple of questions about the stability, which I, I think we're going to be happy to, to answer there as well. And again, that uh, we really are committed to improving uh, not only the Arizona economy, but the national economy with the related to solar energy. Fantastic. An excellent talk. I, I appreciated your statistic about the energy payback time, right? A, a three order of magnitude difference, which is pretty amazing, right? We don't see that very often. So uh, very nice context. I think that's a, a very interesting takeaway to think about. So again, thank you very much for, for setting the stage. Um, as we've done with our webinars in the past, I've pulled from pre-submitted questions and I'm also monitoring in real time the questions and I'll pull from those. So we'll go through and kind of uh, just move into our Q&A period. Aaron, I'll start with you as a, from a pre-submitted question. From a renewable energy perspective, will running everything on solar electricity be practical and, and how might that raise, or how might we handle the storage of solar energy under such a scenario? You know, I think this is always the one when in solar, you get this all the time, right? People want you to tell them what you're gonna do when there's clouds, what you're gonna do when it's nighttime, which is all a viable and you know, reasonable question. I think the argument for solar is that it's free energy. If we don't use it, it's, it's going to impact the earth anyway, right? Or in the case of the indoor PV, we've already converted something to create electricity, to give off light, to light the room. So why not harvest a little bit at the same time, right? So with regards to the uh, energy storage, right? There, what you've got now is not a conversion from sunlight or photons to electrons, but you're in the next stage. Now you're usually in electrons to molecules. So you're trying to use that electricity to create new chemical bonds. And so there you're really at the enthalpy of trying to figure out what are the right types of fuels, right? So obviously we have a large economy based on uh, petroleum types of products and the energy density there. Um, but then trying to think about the next generation types of fuels that don't then contribute to more further curbing emission. So that obviously puts you into things like electrolysis, which is pretty far advanced. Um, but then there's also technologies like redox flow batteries, which have come out of NASA. And there's a huge um, plant out in San Diego that can do this at a massive scale, not just a car battery or a lithium ion battery type of opportunity, um, as well as all of the other types of, of energy conversion types of technologies. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, I'll move to you now, Adam. I know your 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 expertise isn't life cycle analysis, but our, our alumni like to ask such questions. So, can you talk a little bit about life cycle cost of you know today's solar panels? When you again take the whole life cycle, materials processing, insulation, disposal, and are those prices? You know what 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 is the price points, and are they coming down? Yeah, so I, I like to think about this problem in terms of energy payback time. And, uh, you know, Aaron already kind of touched on this where there is a significant order of magnitude difference between silicon and perovskite. And, you know, the, the one thing I would say is the one day payback time is a little optimistic at the moment. Right now, we're sort of at four months for energy payback time for these kinds of devices, but that's significantly better than where we're at at silicon. So even the best silicon device, the very best silicon devices, you still have a year and a half before you're getting that payback, okay? And that, that includes all of, all of the life cycle, right? From, from you know, collecting the materials, the raw materials, to building it, to, to just uh, getting rid of the waste. So that's where we're at right now. Um, that's continuing to improve on, on all fronts, to be honest with you, but particularly on these printable uh, uh, these printable technologies because they're they're relatively new and you know the, the key advantage here is a we can print these at a much lower cost because we can produce these very quickly and we use much less material so you know i talked about 100 micron substrate but for the actual photo absorbing material it's it's much much thinner than that it's it's hundreds of nanometers so we're talking about you know one one hundredth the width of a human hair is is doing all this conversion so as we produce technologies with, with better manufacturing capabilities, we 
produce more efficient technologies, which we're, we're starting to get sort of at the, the height of, of our, our potential efficiency for a lot of these, which, which is a nice problem to have. Um, and, and then really reducing the instabilities in these devices, which has been sort of the key here, um, and, and having longer lifetime devices, then, then that will come down even further, okay? And so I think this is a really competitive technology and, and frankly, I think silicon right now is actually a fantastic technology. We're just doing it better. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Thank you for taking the time on the on the good question. So you're both experts on solar energy, but by extension, you're experts on energy. <laughs> we had a lot of questions submitted in advance talking about nuclear energy and what role it might serve in the I like to think of the portfolio of energy near term, long term, as we look at energy solutions. So I'll ask you both to you know, share your perspectives. I'll go to Aaron and then to Adam. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think this is something that, you know, again, coming back to this argument, yes, there's obviously a variety of different energy solutions and we should you know, not put all of our eggs in one basket per se, but when we think about possibilities for renewables versus nuclear, right? On the one hand, nuclear offers a possibility for a larger capacity factor, how much power that can be supplied to the grid over time, right? That you can run it 100, near 100% 24 hours a day, right? But on the other hand, there's these engineering considerations of better, faster, cheaper. And if we, agree that we need to stabilize the climate change that is happening. In my opinion, nuclear power is too slow to achieve this. It takes too long to build the plants, right? And that the low carbon competition is just going to see, achieve the same metric at a lower cost in least time. And so if we take a look as well in terms of American competitiveness at what other countries are doing, they're investing heavily in renewables and not nearly as much in nuclear. And so I think there's a world connection there as well. That's excellent. Adam, you want to share any thoughts? Yeah, so, so I, I think nuclear is a, is a potential part of the basket just like wind is, just like hydro is, just like geothermal is. And, and when I was talking, I said idealized, you know, 100% solar energy. That's not realistically going to happen. But there is a place for all of these things, right? And, and so if you want large power plants to, to feed a, a, you know, a city, a nuclear would make a lot of sense. But it does take a long time, as, as Aaron said. Regulations are such, as they should be, um, that it, that's difficult to get permission to, to build these things. Um, you know, just looking back recently, you look at Fukushima, excuse me, Fukushima, you don't want to build these things near fault lines. And so that, you know, really active fault lines. So that limits a lot of places where nuclear makes a whole lot of sense, um, number one. Number two, you know, if, if you think about specifically what we're doing with solar, you know, these, these flexible lightweight electronics, um, they, they open up a, another application that nuclear doesn't really have, which is portability, right? And, and so you can deliver the power right where you need it which is you're not carrying a, a little nuclear plant in your backpack anytime soon, okay? And, and so I, I think there, there's, like, there, there's, a, there's a potential for it to be part of the basket, but it has to be a part of the basket. And I think these other, these other technologies have a place as well. Excellent. No, that's, that's great. Yeah, there's a paper out there that was written many years ago. It talks about the, the wedges of, of, you know, you build your energy demand graph with wedges of technologies and you layer them on top of each other. So I think that's good perspective. Um, I'll come back to you, Aaron. Several, I'm going to kind of mash up a few questions because several have asked similar things in different ways. But when we talk about the printable panels, a lot of excitement about those. But then the questions are durability. Can they survive in the harsh Arizona climates? And so can you tell us a little bit about durability of where we are and where we might get in sort of the life cycles of those exciting materials? I we can absolutely get to a cost benefit life cycle. I think the big key too with these flexible panels is because they're going to cost, you know, potentially so much less. You have a more recyclable or a more dynamic technology that you can use. So you can think about it as perhaps an enclosure, not necessarily a piece that is integrated into the life of the entire building, but that could be something where it's more of an art display that actually does harvest energy at the same time. The other thing too is that I think sometimes the word degradation and stability misses the aesthetic appeal of, 
of the seasons, right? Nature does this every year where the leaves change color over time as an indication of the end of the life cycle. And there's a beauty that comes from that that very many people appreciate. And so are they gonna last for 30 years? Preliminary data definitely suggests that with the right encapsulation strategies, yes, this is viable, right? Do they need to last for the next 30 years? That's a different question. And I, I don't think that they do necessarily. Sure, that makes sense. So basically if we had a building that had printable screens on every window at some point in time, you pull them off and put up the next one, right? Right, you can change your color based on your whim. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense, good. Adam, um, you, you, your, your talk, you know, you, you're, both your talks had, you know, teased us with an airplane and space. So tell us a little bit more about the opportunities to apply these technologies to aircraft and spacecraft, maybe some specifics that you might understand or have a little more knowledge about, because I think it, it excites us as engineers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think these make a lot of sense on drone technologies, right? Because you, you don't want, you don't have as much weight, you don't want as much weight on those. Um, and, and so there, there have been applications of these in drone technologies. Um, for space, that's the one that really excites me. Um, and, and I talked about the financial reasons, and I think that that is a pretty obvious driver. For me, you know, just looking at the research itself, that there's there's a lot of potential opportunities there. Um, you know, perovskites are, are kind of interesting because they are lead based, and people think that that might hold hold up to radiation a little bit better. Um, there, there's that's something that we want to look at in the future. Um, you know, the, the big thing here is besides being lightweight, you can also roll these up in, in reels. And, and so if you're sending these into space and you're sending these on long missions, you know, I, I kind of think of space saving as well, right? So not only are you reducing the cost, you want to reduce the, the, the amount of space that's occupied by things that you're bringing that, that aren't you know, absolutely critical for survival. Now energy is absolutely critical for survival, but you want to be able to bring more food, more water. Um, and, and so this is, a, this is an extra bonus of these kinds of, of devices. Um, so this is something that I think is, is really, you know, starting to become that question that's that's starting to get to the top of people's heads. And in the last few years, we're starting to see people actually study this. Um, and, and so I think that this is going to be, um, you know, a, another potential area for the University of Arizona to be a leader, especially with our connections with NASA. Excellent. Good. I'm going to pull a few out of the audience um, that have just been submitted. So it. It seems like there are very few U.S. companies actually producing photovoltaic materials. We've outsourced a lot of that. So, you know, back to our educational mission, what advice would you give to students that really want to work in PV area? You know, do, do the kind of stuff you're doing in your lab when they graduate. What, what career paths might you suggest? And I'll ask, let throw this up as a jump ball. Either of you can take it. I think we probably have the same answer. Think startup. Right. I think the answer is startup. All of the PV companies, there is a bunch associated with uh, NREL, actually, especially in perovskites. You know, and University of Arizona has a fantastic business school that can help you learn how to be an entrepreneur. Um, and we also, like we said, have a very unique test bed for you to benchmark your materials or your panels against. Um, so I think, you know, when, when we think about the future jobs in solar, those jobs are being created right now, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're coming out of the Fortune 500 companies. Excellent. Yep, we have Tech Launch Arizona. We have the Forge now that's really bringing students into that innovation process. So excellent, good answer. Adam, do you want to add, or you're happy with that? No, I, I agree 100. percent I mean, that's that. Like you said, we we think the same way on this one. Good. Um, go to another audience question. We talk about putting solar fields potential on roads themselves so we can maintain and, and use that. Could you even have a scenario where electric vehicles could be charged while driving, kind of like you set your cell phone on the inductive charger and now you're actually using that solar to generate electricity and maybe charge vehicles? So any, any thoughts about that? It's an interesting question. Sure, join my group and study that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Good. Um, any anyone add to that, Aaron? If there is a market, it will be done. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you know, you motivated, and, and I was really glad to see you motivated your talk in, in part by the greater access to historically underrepresented students in engineering. Um, you know, for us, that's female students, African American students, Hispanic students, Native American students. I, I was great to see your your strong focus and success. 
You want to add a few more words about, you know, what you've done to date and the successes that you're seeing? I, I think it's a really important topic for our workforce. But yes, to me, I think multidisciplinary training is really the future for our students. Um, I, I, you learn so much more when you have opportunities to interact with people who have not been trained the exact same way that you have. And that comes down to your fundamental understanding of what's the, what's the topic at hand. You know, how do you explain to someone that's not an engineer how a PV works? Right, but then you also pick up when, when you're talking to them, you, you then understand perhaps the cultural relevance of a technology that you hadn't even possibly considered as well. And so with our workforce development, I, I do think that taking the students into situations where it isn't a regurgitation of an answer, but it's the generation of new knowledge from hands-on learning that comes from team-based science where they have to work together in the different areas in order to really develop a new opportunity, a new product, a business model, what have you. But that's only good can come out of that. So that's great. Let's stick with students for a minute, but let's go to the sort of other end of the student population. And that is the recruitment of top graduate students, which is so key to you advancing your research, us advancing the entire College of Engineering. Um, can you comment, and I'll let both of you have a chance, um, can you comment on the attractiveness of your research to uh, students to come and want in and join your group? You know, does it get them excited? Is it a recruitment tool to, to talk and work on solar energy? I'll let you speak to your experience with Adam and then to Aaron. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that, you know, you're going to recruit a certain kind of student. That's a student who is already interested in energy, specifically solar energy, or we can also recruit students who are interested in this idea of, of green energy or reducing environmental impact of, of different kinds of, of technologies. And so it's been really easy to convince students to come work for us. Uh, you know, I, I'm speaking for Erin here and I'm sure, but, but I know she, she's, she's got some fantastic students and, and, and I've got fantastic students as well. I've been very happy with the students we've been able to recruit to our programs. And they're excited from day one because they know, you know what they're, working on is building a better future. That's exciting. Erin? Yeah, and if we come back to, you know, I touched on this point earlier, is that, you know, the, the printable electronics, the printable solar gives the students an opportunity to learn the characterization tools that are relevant to solar, but they're also translatable across other disciplines, right? So I have a student in my group who is working on solar fuels, which is the harvest of sunlight to electrons to molecules. She's doing a six month internship at Tesla because of her characterization capabilities that she's learned in my group on a related technology. And so it's not just, okay, we're gonna make a bunch of students that know how to make colorful solar panels. Okay, what are we gonna do with it? But that they have this, you know, the, the critical thinking skills, this giant toolbox of materials characterization, transport phenomena that they learn from large scale printing capabilities that translates across. A, a number of energy technologies. Excellent. That was really good, really good answer. Um, are, I, are either of you working with our Arizona utility companies, for example, TEP or SRP? And, and if you're not, maybe what opportunities could you envision? I'll toss that up to both of you. So I'm not currently, and it's really because we're in, you know, this is my I'm going into my fourth year and so we're kind of building to that scale and, and we have programs to build scalability, but TEP and SRP are kind of more interested in module scale devices. So I'm not there yet, but hope to be there shortly. Um, and shortly an academic talk might be a couple of years to be honest, but, but we're progressing in that direction. And so when we get to that point that I think we would be really interested in working with them to see how these things can be implemented and deployed in different kinds of um, you, know, you know, industrial scale and, and residential scale and see how these things really work when they're out in the field. Excellent, Erin? Yeah, so we have through the Institute for Energy Solutions, which is part of the Arizona Institute of Resilience. Um, of course, they're the power companies, our big supporters. We just ran our Arizona Student Energy Conference, which is a tri-university initiative between the University of Arizona, ASU, and Northern Arizona University, and it rotates around. Um, we were on Zoom. Uh, but there as well, you know, they're big supporters. There's opportunities for students to internship with them as well. Um, interfacing with, if we think longer term about the, the projects that Adam and I are working on, we're interested in the, the printable materials, 
right? So then we need people that can help us make large scale modules. Then we need electrical engineers. Um, I mentioned Kelly uh, Simmons Potter earlier um, doing test yard types of, of scaling, um, as well as we also need the local forecasting components. All right, so there's a number of researchers, not just in College of Engineering, but across the whole university that do interface on like kind of local regional scale as well. Um, and there, I think we really have an opportunity um, to leverage those types of partnerships between the utilities, the universities, and the communities at large, um, especially because of some of the initiatives of the city of Tucson as well being quite progressive for renewable energy opportunities. That's outstanding. I'll, I'll have to say proudly that the CEOs of both TEP and SRP are Wildcat engineers. And so I know they're very supportive of things that we're doing, both workforce and technology. So that's great that you've got some inroads. And uh, Adam, when you're ready to move that forward at a scale, let me know and I'll, I'll make some connections. Um, I'm going to pull from the audience again uh, that were just, just posted. Um, so solar farms, as you can have large footprints, and, and Adam, you mentioned, you know, a, a moderate size state of area could meet all of our power needs. So when you, you talk about doing things at larger scales, what are, are there other potential effects, you know, reflection of light back into the atmosphere? What, you know, and, and is there research being done on, you know, issues of large, large scale solar farms, uh, you know, unintended consequences, perhaps? Are people thinking, doing, researching those things? Yeah, I, th I'm, I think they are, but, but we're not really quite there yet. Um, so right now they're focusing a lot. The, the first scalable technology is going to be tandem cells. So we have silicon cell with a perovskite printed on top to kind of absorb more of the, the light. And so in, in that case, we kind of already know how the, the devices are going to behave. Um, from, from what I've seen, there's a lot of work on anti-reflective coatings that are also working as barriers so that you can prevent sort of scatter back, uh, or back, excuse me, back scatter into the, to the environment. Um, you know, one of the big things that, that I think needs to be addressed and, and, and is being addressed is sort of the recyclability of these devices. So as you get larger and larger scale, as I kind of mentioned before, a lot of the best technologies right now are lead-based. And so we want to recover that and then reuse it uh, for, for, for the next uh, generation of, of devices. Um, we're also moving into tin-based perovskites, which are obviously less harmful to the environment, but tend to be less stable. And so I think that's sort of what people are looking at is, is kind of debating more the, the back end of it, the, the, the waste reduction and recycling of these devices rather than things like backscattering. Excellent. Um, I'll pull another audience question for either of you to answer. Now, based on sort of current assumptions, what, what is, is there a maximum theoretical efficiency that some of your cell technologies can go to? Is there you know, a theoretical limit of conversion? Go ahead, Adam. It, it, I don't remember the exact number. It's around 30%. Okay, got it. So, so we're getting pretty close to it. That's outstanding. Good. Um, I'm going to loop back again to energy storage. You know, Aaron, you talked nicely about photons to electrons to molecules. So, you know, when we talk about one mechanism for storing solar energy is to create those molecules, particularly hydrogen, right? Which is a great energy carrier. And you could do that through solar thermal reactions or through traditional electrolysis. Do you want to comment on, on, you know, energy storage via hydrogen and solar as, as a potential part of the storage solution? Yeah, and the way I see it too, there's there's kind of, there's different generations of technologies. The the two that you mentioned, Dean Han, are obviously certainly more commercially advanced. Um, but there's been a huge Department of Energy investments as well in what we call solar fuels, which is instead of having the panel be separate and there's a tank or a vat, and then you have some electrodes, and the panel is powering those electrodes to drive electrolysis, for example, drive a chemical reaction or a conversion. The argument for solar fuels is that can you develop nanoscale, so high surface area, photovoltaic-like materials that don't have any external circuits so that you could just put these into the vat and would spontaneously do the energy conversion. And so that's the more solar fuel semiconductor type of, of approach. Um, that's where you're seeing the solar hubs come out of. You know, Caltech had one, uh, North Carolina has now just gotten the new, uh, one as well and trying to really wrestle with those types of materials challenges. And there too, again, is that yes, there's more of a fundamental science component, but that fundamental science piece impacts a variety of other technologies 
not just can we make hydrogen or its counterpart, can we make oxygen to drive a fuel cell, for example, but you know, other types of reactions because electron transfer and chemical conversion energy is a ubiquitous reaction across a variety of different types of science. So it could relate to healthcare, it could relate to sensing, a whole number of opportunities. No, that's good. It's exciting. You know, my, my own ARPA E project was a solar fuels project, directly taking a uh, high temperature redox to make water to hydrogen, right? And and no no electrons really involved, just just good old thermal chemistry. <laughs> so it's exciting. Um, good. Let's let's stay on the you know the research landscape when we talk about uh, the national funding landscape for your type of research activities. Where do you see the trends in the next five years? Additional, you know calls and money being invested? Do you see it tightening up? Uh, give your, your view at forecasting the you know, renewable energy funding landscape. I'll go to Adam and then to Aaron. Yeah, so this this uh, printing grant that we just won was was just last year, and that was specifically for perovskite technologies, okay? And, and, and so that was the first time they had run that program specifically for perovskites. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of where their head's at. Um, the nice thing for us is, as, as I had said previously, we're sort of bumping that efficiency limits for perovskites. And so focus has shifted to manufacturing and stability. And those are, those are the bread baskets of Aaron and I, to be, to be frank. And, and so for us, um, it, it's actually really favorable going forward for the next few years, because these are the, these are the sort of problems that, that need to be addressed for this technology to be viable. And so, you know, DOE specifically is really interested in getting this technology off the ground, especially with, with you know, record increasing efficiencies, it's, it's now time to get these things out. And so, you know, I, I think there's plenty of opportunity there for us. We also have uh, worked with Department of Defense and they're interested in, in different kinds of, uh, using these maybe not necessarily as solely as energy, but other sort of optoelectronic uh, applications, which are of interest to them. And um, so, so it, there, I think there's a high potential for continuing and actually growing funding for at least the next five years or so. Outstanding. Do you want to add to that, Erin? Yeah, I think too, with the energy conversion, it, it, the funding agencies fully understand that it is not a single discipline problem. And so we're seeing more and more calls for large center proposals, 10, 20, 30, $100 million proposals coming out. Um, especially with the emergence of the new um, Applied Science Directorate coming out of the National Science Foundation. So that there really is this opportunity for the new multidisciplinary type of training for our students under these umbrellas of we're working on a particular technology and everybody has their pieces, but we're moving forward together faster because we, we've got the interplay and we have multiple problems being solved simultaneously. Excellent. I'm going to stick with you for a minute, Aaron. You know, you could be the poster person for interdisciplinary background, you know, your education training, your career training, engineering, science. Can you just speak a little bit about the need or the value to bring together different disciplines, chemistry, physics, engineering, to tackle these problems from your own experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, the thing that motivates me is I like to learn new things. That really is what gets me out of it gets me up and going every day. And so I think too, you know, you make a decision when you're an undergrad to go in a particular direction and that doesn't have to define your career, right? Even if we, you know, we're talking to our alumni right now, you can come back, you can, you can work on these other types of technologies or you can advance uh, your training in a variety of different ways. Um, and that we really are all, all lifelong learners when we focus on these types of technologies. Excellent, good. You know, when we talk about engineering solutions, we've, we've touched here and there on cost and, and return on investment. So you really, at scale, we can't get away from that. Can you speak a little bit to the ability at some point in time of solar to displace the majority of, of hydrocarbon-based electricity generation and still keep those costs down? I, I looked up the average kilowatt hour cost in Arizona is about 12 cents. So, you know, that is, that's a market rate. Um, so what, what do you think about the prospects of, of doing things at scale and, and keeping the costs at those kinds of costs? It's a big question. I'll, I'll throw this to Adam and if Aaron wants to add, you can. Yeah, so that is a big question. I, again, we're not trying to displace entirely these fossil fuels, right? We're part of a basket here. But if you look at what you know, NRL is saying, um, and, and NRL has recently said in 2020, the cost of actually implementing these on rooftops, for example, 
is, is below that 12 cents per kilowatt hour. We're at actually eight to 10 cents per kilowatt hour for solar at the moment. And for industrial scale, we're, we're a little bit lower. We're around six to eight cents per kilowatt hour. And there's been a real push by the DOE through the Sunshot goal, um, which is a 2030 sort of benchmark that, that the whole, uh, the whole it, you know, wide range of researchers and, and industry and, and solar is trying to hit, which is to reduce these costs uh, even further. So by 2030, we want residential costs to be down to six, or excuse me, five cents per kilowatt hour, uh, commercial to be down to four cents and industrial to be down to three cents. Wow. Okay? And, and so we, we've made tremendous progress towards that area, uh, towards that goal, excuse me. And, and like I said, we're, we're at 10 cents now for residential slash commercial. And that, that I have to point out, that is without any sort of um, sort of funding by, by federal uh, Sub government. Subsidiary, got it, sure. So we're, we're there, we're, we're already at parity. Um, and so it's really just a, you know, I, I see it sort of as an educational thing at this point is, is convincing people that we're there, it's time to start moving to these technologies and adopting them because they will reduce our, our energy costs. Really exciting, excellent, good. I didn't realize we were kind of at that 10 cents. So that's great, that provides the cost return to put those in and recoup your capital. Um, so last kind of question to each of you, you know, let's look forward 20 years from now. What problems do you think will be solved in renewable energy? And what do you think next challenges or continuing challenges might be? I'll go to Adam, then I'll give Aaron the final word. Yeah, so, you know, one of them is, is educating people, convincing them to, to adopt these technologies because for so long you have been told, oh, solar is the future, solar is the future, and it never made sense. And now we're finally at the point where it's, it's sort of the future and, and it's starting to make a lot of sense. Um, so convincing people to start adopting this technology at a larger scale is a big thing. Um, you know, for perovskites, we want to increase the manufacturability. We want to build that workforce that can actually take over these jobs. Um, so, you know, I saw a question I think was quickly deleted. I, maybe, maybe I'm just missing it, um, which, was, which was something related to jobs lost by replacing fossil fuel industry jobs with, with solar jobs. Um, you look at the big companies like Exxon and Chevron, they're, they're, they're interested in solar. And there's a reason they're interested in solar because there's money to be made there. And so if they can make money, <laughs> that will continue to have jobs, even if we transition from one technology to another. Excellent. Okay. And, and so one thing I didn't say is my, in my background is my bachelor's is in finance. So I have a little bit of a love for economics. And back in the late 1800s, there was a rebellion because all the sewers were really upset about the invention of the sewing machine, okay? And they were nervous that it was going to put them out of work. And within three decades, there was an order of magnitude more jobs in sewing than there was before the invention of the sewing machine. So I think we have to look at um, potential for job creation by implementing these new technologies that actually improve efficiency uh, across the board. Outstanding, nice, nice history lesson too. Erin. Um. I'm not sure I could say it better than a, a, an analogy from the 1800s. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, our energy demand is also only going to increase. Uh, I know even in the state of Arizona, for example, uh, Facebook is looking in, putting in some pretty serious data storage hubs. And, you know, what are we going to do with all of this data that we're able to generate, whether it's, it's, what we're generating on our phone, what we're going to be generating in healthcare, et cetera, and all of that also requires energy. And so as we continue to scale and scale and scale, um, better, faster, cheaper, I think energy is always gonna be at the forefront um, and a major foundation for all of our strategies going forward. Absolutely, that is fantastic. I really wanna thank both of you for joining us for an hour to uh, entertain the questions from our alumni and friends and supporters and uh, you know, educate a little bit people a little bit about the exciting things we're doing both on the research front and on the student training front. So thank you both for coming. I want to thank our audience for joining us. We'll be back again next month with another exciting uh, webinar. Till then, have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.